Uh, Brooks, with your permission, I wonder if I could just put two questions. First of all, one to the fear agent, and then the other one to the enforcer. Um, Mr. Naidu, to you, first of all, I saw that same fairy godmother uh, at the urinal. Um, I just got on with what I was doing and called security. Obviously, you had a, you had a fairly in-depth conversation. And uh, Ivan, Jim, uh, in the holding room at the back, I, I noticed that you were in deep conversation with, uh, with Jay Naidu, with Zuelan Zima Vavi, with Iraj Abedian, with Prince Mashele, and even Chester Missing at some point. Uh, when are you launching your new political party? And uh, what's the name going to be? Because I sense we saw the embryonic start of something downstairs. And there is no answer at all. Iraj Abedian, let me start with you if I can. Um, <laughs> otherwise, this is just going to be an afternoon of monologue, I fear. Um, you spoke about corruption being embedded in society. I, I find that an incredibly distressing and, uh, uh, and, and, and worrying uh, analysis of where we are in this country. Are you suggesting to us that this is almost a cancer that we can't get rid of? Because none of the ideas that any of you have come up with are going to bear any fruit unless we tackle that head on. And I don't think I heard a single big idea as far as how we're going to change that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all the economic literature, sociological literature on corruption um, over the past 50 years across all developmental countries, races, etc., etc., suggests that whenever the, the, the underlying or embedded value system within the society is diluted or destroyed, corruption emerges. It emerges in business, for example, they see it as performance and bonuses and, and achievement uh, when they collude to to multiple the price of bread and medicine and the very, price, the very pharmaceutical supply that should go to the poor, somebody gets a bonus on by, by raising the tender price. And we can go on and we haven't got time, but the essence of it is when the moral value system is not defined in a heterogeneous society, that absence of a generally internalized and debated moral value system manifests itself in a political party, for example, they all uh, collude and caucus and, and they get rid of whatever they, they don't want uh, in, at branch level, at regional, national level. That, they call it political achievement. In business, they call it something else. In academia, call it something else. So all organs of the society, when the value system is not defined and internalized, when integrity is not defined, for example, with the, with the crisis that we have, by now we should have had a few ministers actually stepping down as a matter of principle, evidence or no evidence. Uh, with the crisis that we have in some of our universities, our schools, uh, vice chancellors should actually resign as a matter of principle, not try to put a commission of inquiry and, and decide who is in, wrong in raping the kids and, and, and the students. In business, when some of these collusion results came out, some ch uh, chairman and board members and chief executive should step down as a matter of Respect to the society. We don't get it. In a state, we see waffling around it and justification. And, and some even apply history because we come from apartheid past. Corruption is okay today. So I think um, what I'm suggesting is that we have a systemic issue. We mustn't skirt around it. Or as Vavi mentioned, dance around it. We should address it head on in business, in government, etc. So what, w what would you have us do? How do we go and define this moral value system that you refer to? We need to have a discussion around uh, uh, a prerequisite for our social capital is what would define South African? What is the value system that we, we pride ourselves in? We have a, should have an open discussion. I'm not talking about the religious stuff. I'm talking about what is a fundamental requirement of social prosperity. If you talk about the Swiss, they pride themselves in efficiency. If you talk about the German, there are something else. If they were South Korean, they define themselves as something else. What would define what should you and I talk to our children about? This is what a South African does and does not accept. We haven't had a discussion around it. And therefore, everybody describes it on a different platform, excuses it away for some or other reason. Um, can I add a question to uh, Comrade Jim <coughs> as you answer Jeremy's question? You, you, you suggest that uh, all political parties that exist in South Africa today uh, are bad. The only party that is going to be good is your party, which is yet to be formed. 
Yet, as I was listening to you, you sounded more like uh, an older brother of Julius Malem, because you all call for nationalization. How different are you from Julius Malem? Look, I think, thank you for the questions. <laughs> I think the, just a small contribution on the debate about corruption. I think it's important to say that the fight against corruption, I don't think it should be viewed as a single battle in a single front. I think it must be an all-sidedness. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's, it's very important that whenever we, people get an opportunity to say something, we must condemn corruption. But I think if we're sitting in a 20 years in a democracy, in a country that has been a victim of a system that makes sure that the vast majority of the people are excluded to be part of the economy, and we can confirm today by figures that the two decades of democracy, the most beneficiaries have only been the white monopoly capital and white population. Why should we not see that as corruption? And I'm asking, I mean, why, why, why that is not seen as corruption? And, and I'm just saying, I think we do need to take a very nuanced approach that robbing of the people of this country, in particular black, they, all the social surplus, they will live in squalor and everything else. Um, for me, is that if we are to succeed on the fight on corruption, um, which, by the way, if we don't address some of the nice things that Jay was talking about, I support that teachers must teach. But if you don't deal with issues of ownership and control of the economy and ensure that both black and white have got equal access to the economy, I carry an iPad, and because I live a middle-class life, because metal workers pay very well, my children afford to get this iPad. They teach teachers before they are being taught by teachers. And I'm saying if other children of the working-class township children brings poverty to school, you can end up being racist, because you can prove that we'll spend so much money, but we're not getting results. What's wrong with these black people? They are not passing with spending money. Therefore, the issue of full implementation of the Freedom Charter, addressing issues of ownership and control, is fundamental for us to be able to deliver comprehensively to those basic needs of our people. Deep conversation with Zueli. Yes, I think Zueli must be convinced to accept that uh, we all love the ANC a lot. We know no other organization. But I think the time has come for the working class to organize itself as a class for itself. The reasons are very simple. The reasons are very simple. We have done this for the past 20 years. I'm a good lobbyist. I'm a product of the African National Congress. But the recent past have demonstrated that we are busy following symbols. And people don't eat symbols. People don't eat slogans. People don't care about big politics that we talk. They care about basic necessities that must be delivered. Now, the only option the working class has been doing, as if it has no political confidence of itself, it has been about to swell the ranks. And in a multi-class formation like the African National Congress, where we all grew up, uh, which, I mean, we, we, it's a very difficult situation. You lobby and lobby. I mean. The debate on nationalization in the ANC National Policy Conference, how when the, all delegates in the conference endorse nationalization of the commanding heights of the economy. But because key individuals who form part of the leadership made sure that that resolution was cleaned out. So, at what point? Because the issue of the economy in this country and making sure that power relations are changed is at the center of fundamental change in the country. Look, you're right. We champion full implementation of the Freedom Charter. Julius Malema was dismissed and fired for championing that cause. There was not a single old person and an adult who said, you young, come closer, purely for implementing, calling for full implementation of the Freedom Charter. They were dismissed. The truth is, but the very same movement 
When it comes to election every after five years, campaign on the basis that the Freedom Charter is our document, because true, that's the only document that our people will vote for. Well, you just heard the birth of a new political party, but um, I want to read a quote from one of our panelists. Uh, but now our political leadership has aligned itself with the global looters. Our political leadership is no longer able to represent the nation because it has a conflict of interest. Does anybody recognize who said that? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Man in the middle. Uh, there's a question from the audience uh, that we, we got electronically, and it is, in fact, addressed to you. Uh, the question was simply, um, your argument effectively is that the poor and the workers are essentially the same group and that you are representing their interests. But in fact, workers who are members of your union represent effectively, in economic terms, the middle class. And their interests and the unemployed poor have very different and divergent interests. How do you square that circle, either in your mind and in practical terms? And this is, as I say, a question directly from the audience. I don't believe that that's a conservative question. I guess we represent workers, and in South Africa, our trade unions built by Comrade Jay Naidu, one of the things that they champion has been to champion shop floor struggles with community struggles. What has flowed over time from that has been the whole question of solidarity. The workers in South Africa who are represented by NUMSA, yes, some of them qualify to be the middle class, but I can tell you the bulk majority of our own members end between 3,500 and so forth, meaning that South African capitalism con is continuing to thrive at the back of super exploitation of black and African labor. If there's one thing that which we're raising, if you're looking to the strike that is now approaching uh, three months in the platinum belt, where basically after people have been killed, maimed, for purely just visiting a mountain, there was no mine where they were. The police had every capacity to disperse those people. They were not sleeping there. But for disrupting, for being viewed through a strike that they are disruptive, they had to be killed in that particular mountain. And I'm sure everybody would have seen the processes. Basically, people wanted us to use a nice English trajectory. Quite frankly, this was a massacre of our time. Now, many people are raising the question about, are we an elitist, a trade, union, a trade union's elitist and the members that we represent? I think if people are looking to the statistics and the facts, there is still super exploitation in this country. We have not defeated the colonial wage. We, the Freedom Charter calls for the ANC government to introduce a national minimum wage. There's no national minimum wage in this country. Zuelin Zimavavi was taken to suspension after we have taken a decision to campaign for that national minimum wage. I think it's coming back, we need to take a campaign on introduction of the national minimum wage. But a question can be asked, why should we be subjected to matches until we have got rickets? Do people think that when workers embark on a the street, they like to match? I don't think so. I think government that has adopted the Freedom Charter, which is the, it is the Bible of the people of this country, has got an inherent duty to introduce that national minimum wage. Ivan, thank you very much. I'm just worried, uh, Brooks, that, that Jay is going to nod off. So let me, put a, let me put a question to him if I can. Jay Naidu, you, you tweeted this last night. You said this, real democracy is when political leaders in government are afraid of the people. I hope it's coming back to you. This wasn't done in the men's room, was it? Uh, it fails when people are scared of their government. You tweeted that last night. Are you suggesting that the majority of South Africans are scared of their government? They're scared of President Zuma? I, I absolutely believe that we are scared. I mean, the type of fear we see in this country almost reminds me of what we lived under apartheid. 
And, and there's some genuine reasons for it. You know, if you're a civil servant, and the majority of civil servants are decent, honest people. But a civil servant working in, an, in a municipal office and seeing how the tenders get crooked. And he's told, I chaired the DBSA for 10 years, and I, and I know a lot of people in, lo in local government and a lot of workers that I mum, meet. And they say, Comrade Jay, there is stealing going on here. Yeah. But I know if I have to blow the whistle here, yeah, I lose my job. I probably get hurt very badly in the place where I work because they know where I stay. I have a mortgage. I have children to educate. I have food to put on the table. And there isn't laws today that are enforced that protects whistleblowers. Because we know whistleblowers are getting killed. So there's fear amongst the civil servants. But in spite of that fear, you and the media are getting tremendous amounts of information from whistleblowers. There's fear, but please, can I be anonymous? If you look at the challenges that we face on some of the big scandals here, whether it's Marikana, whether it's in Kandla, you know, a lot of people that are entrusted with the legal constitutional responsibility to investigate and produce in a unbiased, independent, non-partisan way, a finding, are too afraid. So <clears throat> I look at it, look at what's happening, you know, in this remarkable public, you know, broadcaster that when I was Minister of Communications, Zulaki Sisulu was, was the CEO. And I knew the tremendous pressure that was put on him to make sure that the right news was broadcast. And what we had as an agreement, any call you get, refer them to me. And I will give you that aerial cover. In many cases, today it's the very minister that's making the call. And what is it? Is that, again, it comes back to the issue, do you want to lose your job? And you lose your house, you lose your life. And I think there is genuine fear. And I think that what we've got to decide is, is that we fought. Freedom was about the freedom to have your voice heard. The constitutional principle of the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, and the freedom of, uh, of protest is a constitutional right about justice that we can never compromise on. And that's what I'm saying, is that we go back, I look at today and look at the issues that people can organize around. I wish I was 50 years younger. It's an it's a organizer's dream here. You have so many issues you can take up. And you have a democratic government that's just going to throw you into jail or torture you. Well, not all of you. <laughs> but we have rights today. And you still ask the question, what can I do? Um, Iraj. It is, it is widely believed that supporters of Julius Malema are young, uneducated, and hopeless. The ANC proposes that it will employ six million of them in expanded public works programs. The DA says it will employ seven million of them. As an economist, what do you think you can do for that constituency? I think I must make a confession that in 1994 and once, uh, June of 1994, and once in uh, around September of 1999, I wrote the base paper for public works program. And Jay was in Kusatu at that time. I had done the work before that for Kusatu. So am I in favor of public works program? Absolutely yes, as a, as a component of a jigsaw puzzle of fighting poverty. Is it a job? No. Do I call it employment? No. We never called it in those documents public employment program. We call it public works program as a mass literature in developmental and, and macroeconomic literature about what are the most dignified way of taking care of the poor in transitional space. So yes, there is a space for, um, for anti-poverty channels, one of which is public works program. Does it mean that it can do six million? Is that the solution? The answer is absolutely not. And I don't think ANC is talking about six million jobs. It's talking about six million job opportunities. Uh, and that is where the youth get angry. 
and, and public works programs typically are not suitable for the profile that you mentioned, Prince, educated, hopeless, and so on and so forth. These are people who've got 30, 40, uh, 20 years of economic life ahead of them, and you cannot subject them to public works program job opportunities. We need to sit back um, and, and really rethink, as they say these days, uh, alt, control, delete, reboot. We need to reboot the system. This debate around, uh, I think Jay uh, hit, it, hit the nail on the head, the workplace dynamics is changing. We need to rethink how are we going to enable our youth, which is our future, to not only have a job, but also to be empowered to see the new opportunities at the workplace completely differently. If it means that for our six to seven million we have to spend for the next three, four, five years to create that capability, we should do it. That's a very good, sound investment to do. So as an economist, I'm in favor of uh, uh, taking, and I think uh, Dr. Ampele this morning referred to it, um, one of the mechanisms that we should use is we've got locked up 60 to 70 billion rand in, in the CETA fund for the past 10 years, 15 years. We've got to reboot and reuse, not in bureaucratic structures, in partnership with business and technology centers to enable our youth to equip themselves, re-equip themselves for the future job place. Can we do it? Yes. And will all of them succeed? No. Will enough of them succeed to reduce the problem? I have absolutely no doubt. I think we're going to be getting a hand signal any moment now to say we have to move along uh, to the next and last item. but. I just want to say I was startled by the energy and enthusiasm of an, of an economics discussion. Um, sometimes these things are hard. Uh, but as I was listening, I took notes. And it seemed to me that of the three panelists, uh, there, were one, two, three, there were five and a half points that were pretty much in common. Um, that if you were to reboot the economy and the structures that go with it, You'd need to include greater economic growth, much less waste and corruption, fuller, more comprehensive equity, more employment or the creating of employment by potential workers, greater state capacity and a real diligence on the part of members of parliament and above all civil servants and teachers. If you all agreed to this, what's left? What do we... What is, is there an argument left, or do you actually all agree that these are the key ingredients? In sort of a summary moment, uh, I asked the, the three of you to address that. I think for me, the, the point that um, Mr. Jim makes about over the past 20 years, the working class not having received their, their fair share of economic growth is something that needs really careful attention. Um, I would not necessarily agree that uh, nationalizing and putting the state in charge, please help us, God. If they can't uh, manage what they, they have control on now, imagine if they were running every mine and every factory. It would be an absolute chaos. So the, the, there are disagreements, but where I do agree 100% is that we need to focus on working class and the poor. And there are more than enough opportunities in our economic landscape and in, an, in our industrialization landscape. If we reboot, and by reboot, I'm not being facetious. I'm very serious that we need to reboot on what our economic opportunities are, how we can, in our redesigned economic system, make sure that the working class does not end up under a black bourgeoisie in the same position. Uh, can we do it? Of course we can. Should we do it? I think unless we do it, we are not going to create uh, social capital or stability that is absolutely necessary for future success. Can I say something on that? I think I'm, I'm worried about reboot. I think we really need to kickstart differently. Because the bottom line is that the macroeconomic policies we adopted since 1996, who are we waiting for to wake up and realize that they failed? And therefore we need a complete new growth path with new sets of policies. 
They fell. It was growth. You probably wrote some of the... Yeah, no, I, I, I remember that. Growth, employment, and redistribution. We know what needs to be done. We need to revisit how we have liberalized trade because we allow jobs to be destroyed across various sectors of the economy. We need to revisit the extent which we have removed exchange control because we've allowed money to leave this country into casino economy. I know that this debate is in the deep casino. I don't believe in a casino economy. Um, I mean, we have allowed money which we need to be invested in productive sectors of the economy. We can be able to create jobs if we do that. So that that money is invested in productive sectors of the, of the, of the economy. Why are we not imposing export tax on our own minerals? So that those who are so keen to get our minerals, if you so feeling very slowly and the, uh, to quickly think that we must take time and workshop people about the fact that nationalization is very key because if we are not going to do that, and I, I agree with you, there's both delivery, there's also a danger of corruption if it is not under worker control and there's a transparent process of the public. But I want somebody to tell me, what is the justification of letting our minerals to leave this country? They benefit all other developing economies. They are beneficiated there. They come here back to us as finished product. Why can't we take a stand that some of those minerals will build our own manufacturing base? And my argument, my argument is that we need to take a decision. And that decision is to say to us, manufacturing matters. I mean, I was explaining here that we lost about seven foundries. A country like Ghana, all what it simply did was to ban exportation of, of scrap. In this country, if you say, let's, let's impose export tax on minerals, the whole national treasury, they have got flu. For what? <laughs> and, and if you were to do that, those, those who are looking for minerals, they will set companies here and be able to create jobs. We have lost now, and I'm saying people are saying we're serious about job. I want to be told, how are we serious? We have lost our competitive advantage on electricity. Small, medium-sized companies are closing in this country. We're negotiating retrenchment. The, the public, minister, public enterprise minister, he says he's going to build um, um, uh, black millionaires. How are these black millionaires being built? And I also question, how do they, where do they get money to buy these mines? They buy mines, of course they've got a face like me, so they qualify. And they take our good coal out of the country, our national grid is supplied with inferior coal at what price? At exorbitant prices. And what is the negative impact to the economy? Small, medium-sized companies cannot, cannot survive. They are closing. Why can't we have mines that, uh, maybe you will agree with this one, take few mines, don't give it to few individuals. You say these ones are going to be dedicated to supply the national grid so that the country cheap so that the country can have a competitive advantage on electricity. So I want to argue that we know what we need to do to create jobs. I don't support this public works program. What skill? Why must we send children to school to study, and when they finish, they must go and collect papers? When there's an opportunity for job, they must be paid a stipend on something called youth wage subsidy. Well, <laughs> you know, Having been there in 1994 and part of the design of some of these programs, uh, you know, we have to, you know, there's some tough choices to be made. So whether you call it reboot or kickstart, it's the same thing. So let's reboot and kickstart a new discussion about issues of joblessness, of education and skills and training, of poverty, inequality and corruption. Let's, let's, let's have an honest conversation about this. And, and I think that that's an important starting point because it's like the social security network that we built, the net. It's a remarkable achievement. But look at it. One in three South Africans stays out of absolute poverty because we give them a grant. That's two sides of the coin. And we've got to have an approach. This cannot be a permanent feature. Anyway, if we do not grow the economy, we won't be able to afford it. So we have to talk about building the productive sector. Then we look at it and say, there are tens of thousands of people that are educated walking the streets. What's stopping them starting their own businesses in all the sectors that you are talking about? We are exporting jobs by just sending raw materials out. You know, so we know that. 
Now, what are the barriers for us to start to beneficiate that? What are the, the choices and the compromises that we all have to make, whether you are labor, whether you are civil society, whether you are government? This is the roadmap we need to look at, and not this fabulous, paradise-inspiring job summits, which are a load of bullshit, actually. <laughs> <coughs> we don't need any new white papers on this. We need to get people around to say, what are the barriers? What stopped the tens of thousands of black entrepreneurs who are part of our struggle for freedom becoming the medium and large enterprises of, of today? What stopped them? What did we do wrong? That they feel today they are squeezed out, they don't get tenders, and through that we are destroying the industrial capacity of our country. Because when someone is not prepared to pay, pay a bribe, they might as well close down rather than pay the bribe. And there's lots of black entrepreneurs that have closed down. So I think we've got to come back to our conversation today. None of the, the sort of fairy godmother conversations. It's about if we do not do something, the demographic dividend I talked about will become your demographic nightmare. And they will have a legitimate right to rise up and attack you in your bubbles that you live in, whether you are union leaders or you're corporate leaders or you're government leaders. Yeah. There, there is a question from the audience for uh, Comrade Jim. You represent narrow interests of your members who are workers. Why do you posture as if the agenda of your members is the same as the agenda of the unemployed and the poor? That sounds like it's coming from Market Foundation. <laughs> uh, look, I mean, I think this debate is a big debate. The unemployed in this country, and I, I try to answer this question, the few people who, who have not yet even get to a point of a living wage, and I must say that usually this worry about unions yeah, no, it's, called, it's called a sabotage. <laughs> this worry about trade unions being elitist, being narrow, being selfish, and if they were to be clamped down, then there could be many jobs in the economy. It's not a neutral question. It is a position that the Market Foundation has been championing. DA in particular has been championing. And, and it comes out of a belief that race to the bottom is a solution for our problem. And I think we're already talking about workers who have got jobs who are in the street for almost three months because of starvation wages that they are being paid. And I think the point I'm making is that in this country, the few workers who have got jobs support five to six families who don't have a plate of food. And, and, and trade unions, they have got the back against the wall. They know what needs to be done to create jobs. But to date, in a 20-year period, we have not been able to focus on those particular areas where jobs can be created so that the unemployed can be able to have jobs. And I think we will not allow a situation where a buffer is created or a wedge is driven between unemployed and those who work. Unfortunately, although this is exciting and energizing and I'm learning a great deal. I've been told in no uncertain terms that it is time to say thank you very much to uh, Iraj Erwin. Know more about your world. ENCA.com.